by the Saturday morning, and this had taken the whole week, um, my doctor decided I got a chest infection and he'd left some amoxicillin at the chemist and someone was going to collect it. So the person who was going to collect it was in the house, my house, luckily, because I live on my own. And we worked out that I'd probably been in bed for about two days with all my clothes on, including my coat. I was very, very cold and I was sort of unconscious. So she began ringing 111 rapidly. It was taking her ages to get through. And then while she was doing that, my brother turned up. He lives about 25 minutes away with his wife, who's quite strict, fortunately. And they'd had two phone calls, one from my daughter who said that she'd been in touch with me and I told her that the house was full of people sleeping in my bed and that I was sleeping on the bathroom floor. And one from a friend of mine who told him that he thought they thought I might have had a stroke. Either that or I was very, very drunk. So you can see what my friends think of me. Anyway, it alarmed my sister-in-law enough to insist that my brother and she come and find out what was going on. And when they got here, they, they rang for an ambulance, but there weren't any ambulances available. So they took me by a roundabout route to their local hospital, thankfully, which is in Banbury. And they weren't allowed in because everyone thought I had COVID. But they went home, they left me there, and then they had a phone call that night to say that I was in an ambulance being delivered to the intensive care unit in Oxford because I couldn't breathe. And then when I'd been in Oxford overnight, they had another phone call to say that my organs were shutting down one after the other and that my children should be told. Well, as it happened, my son was on his way for a holiday with me. He lives in Indonesia. And because of COVID, I hadn't seen him for three years. So I've been excited about seeing him. But I was in a coma. So what I didn't know was that it was a good few days before I heard my son. Um, but my experience was that I wasn't in a coma. I'd been abducted, put in a car boot, tied up, gagged, uh, beaten and tortured with terrible sound effects. The sound effect of Peppa Pig um, being asked to account for any sin I'd ever committed and I there are a few. <laughs> you get to 65, you've got a few sins to atone for. I can tell you that. We all have. I did a lot of um, apologising in this coma to these terrible, horrible people. They'd got electrodes on my head. They were trying to take my personality away. And they'd bring me up to a level of consciousness where I could just about hear them moving around, clanking the chains, and they'd be shouting at me, Cherry, open your eyes! Cherry, open your eyes! But I thought, that's the last thing I'm going to do. If they see I'm actually conscious, it's better to play dead. But then, one day, I heard a voice I knew, my son's voice, and he was saying, Mum, 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 it's your Roro. Mum, mum, I'm really here. I'm really here. Mum, can you open your eyes? Can you open your eyes? And he had his hands on my hand. And I thought, that sounds like my son. That sounds like a voice I've been wanting to hear for three years. Oh, that's his hand. I can feel his hand. So I risked it because at that point, I decided it would be safer never to breathe again. But just at that point where I think the medics were getting very worried, I did open my eyes and I did see my son. And I was able to uh, be optimistic enough to decide to get better, um, which sounds a bit melodramatic. But I still maintain that it's not just science that saves lives. It's love too.